every American, young or old, is proud of his country. For America stands for democracy, for independence, and for the idea that all men are born free and equal. But in too many U.S. communities today, things are happening of which no American can be proud. Police of this town ought to give property owners some protection. Such disrespect for the rights of others is often the result of careless talk among thoughtless American families. Daddy! Hello, son. Yeah, who are you playing with? Sammy, he's an old boy. Oh, are they Jews? What's Jews? Who is this Sammy that Johnny's been playing with? Is that new family across the street Jewish? Oh, yes, and he's been over there all afternoon. Aren't there any other kids on this block? Those who seek selfish power are quick to set American against American, systematically and purposefully, by singling out one minority or another as a target for old and reasonless hatreds. In the name of Americanism, but in the spirit of Nazism, rabble-rousers spread doctrines closely resembling those inspired by Adolf Hitler. With sometimes appalling consequences, they encourage neighbors to hate and quarrel with each other. But for every American publicly spreading the doctrines of intolerance, there are today many others carrying on an organized fight for understanding and decency, because they know that liberty lies in the hearts of men and women that when it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can save it. Our fellow Americans against hate attacks and answer anyone who speaks along the lines of racial or religious hate. Do you also pledge? To combat those who preach hatred, Men of all faiths and racial background are forming such groups as the National Conference of Christians and Jews, headed by Dr. Everett Clinchy. We're talking about brotherhood. What do we mean by brotherhood? Brotherhood is giving to others the same rights and dignities that we want to keep for ourselves. When this war is over, there will arise some pretty tough economic, social, and political problems. But no problem will be too tough if Protestants, Catholics, and Jews remain together when this war is over. Appealing to the conscience and reason of civilians and servicemen alike, these organizations are receiving hearty cooperation from enlightened military leaders who know that fighting men must respect each other in order to work as an effective team. Let me suggest these precepts which each of us might take to his own heart. First, don't generalize. I have yet to find a single group stigmatization which is correct. They're all false. Second, don't compare the worst in another group with the best in your own. It's dishonest logic and it will not bear the light of facts. Third, have friends in other groups. Fourth, judge a man for what he is and what he does and not for his antecedents. Throughout the land, religious leaders have joined the fight, aware that if any one faith or sect is in danger, no other is safe. One of the last official acts of the late Cardinal O'Connell of Boston was to issue through the press a solemn appeal to a nation which honors democracy. Uh, gentlemen, this is the statement drawn up jointly by His Eminence Cardinal O'Connell, Archbishop of Boston, and by Bishop Oxnam as representative of the Massachusetts Council of Protestant Churches. Like God's great mercy, Christian love is boundless. It extends to all our fellow men. It does not ask their nationality, race, or social position. Hence racial antagonism, or lack of mutual respect of man for man, 
offends both the precepts of the Almighty and the traditions of our beloved nation. It is the prayer of all men of goodwill that discord and intolerance, so alien both to the gospel of Christ and to the democratic spirit of our country, may never gain a foothold in this land. From the time when the first Negro slaves were brought into the South, the status of the Negro has been primarily a Southern problem, one that Southerners feel they must solve in their own way without interference from the North. Today, more and more Southerners, convinced that denying the Negro an equal chance to work and vote is no solution to the problem, are seeking some means by which white men and colored men can live peacefully and happily with respect for each other's rights. Helping to shape and foster this attitude are liberal Southern journalists like Richmond's Virginia Stabney. Ben, how does this hit you? The Richmond Times Dispatch advocates the employment of colored police in Southern cities instead of having occasionally unsympathetic white officers patrolling the colored areas. We urge that the salaries of teachers in the public schools be the same for both races, where the requirements and work are the same. We propose that colored doctors be permitted to serve colored hospitals, and we suggest the abolition of racial segregation in the streetcars and buses of Virginia. In Atlanta, Georgia, the Southern Regional Council applying to this problem some of the best minds of both races, is seeking a solution acceptable to white and colored alike. Aware that likes and dislikes which have existed for generations cannot easily be brushed aside, they are seeking to make it clear that the traditional Southern way of life has nothing to lose and much to gain by granting the colored man, in fact, what the Constitution long ago granted him in theory, equal consideration, equal opportunity, and equal justice. They are convinced that giving the Negro the right to as good a job and as good a living as he is capable of earning will ease social and economic tensions which have long been a handicap to those of both races. Southerners in all walks of life are beginning to realize that this problem concerns their well-being as much as it does their conscience. The true progress of the Negro is too often retarded by the fears and prejudices aroused by meaningless shouts for social equality. That phrase, social equality, means nothing. It never has. The goal of both democracy and religion is human equality. Equal rights before the courts and under God. Equal opportunity for education. And fair pay for good work decent housing and neighborhoods in which to grow up. What the white Southerners want for Negroes is simple justice. Anything less than that is futile talk. One of many states working on the problem of prejudice is Massachusetts, where Leverett Saltonstall, when he was governor, directed the commissioner of education, Julius E. Warren, to form a committee to study and alleviate race tensions. From the beginning, this committee saw the problem as one of education, of the adult whose mind was not already too tightly closed, and above all, of youngsters who were willing to learn the right way to live with their neighbors. One thing we can be perfectly sure of in connection with this complex social problem is that no child was ever born with race prejudice. In fact, the young child has a good deal of trouble learning to take on the prejudices and hates of his parents and playmates. The governor's committee saw already an operation in nearby Springfield, a striking program for the promotion of racial and religious amity 
based upon the recommendations of such well-known educators and enemies of intolerance as Dr. Clyde Miller of Columbia University. Racial and religious hatred is just another of the mental and emotional diseases which are sweeping the world today as plagues and pestilences once swept the world before science and education controlled them. This pestilence can be controlled too. That's what we're trying to do here in Springfield by education which reaches the young at all times, in every grade and school, which penetrates home life and community life, we are trying to immunize your children against the racial and religious antagonisms which have helped to bring on world war and mass murder. With time and with your help as parents, I think we can do it. Under the Springfield Plan, the curriculum of every school is pointed toward education and democracy, toward a genuine and sympathetic understanding of the many racial, religious, and national who built the United States, made it great, and enriched it with the cultures they brought with them from the old world. In parochial schools and public schools alike, every child is taught that a decent respect for the origins, customs, and beliefs of others, however these may differ from one's own, is a fundamental element of true democracy. Children of American origin are encouraged to understand and value the cultural contributions of foreign groups. And those of foreign origin are taught to take pride, as Americans, in the countries of their ancestry. One of the main places in this Russian campaign is this city. L-W-O-W, -W Teddy, perhaps there's someone in the room whose people came from Poland who could pronounce that word for us. It's pronounced Bavuk. My mother told me so, and she was born there. In geography, the emphasis is put on understanding peoples of other lands. Brazilian people. Some of them are white, some of them are Indian, and some of them are Negroes, and lots of them are just in between. But it doesn't matter very much in Brazil what color you are. They don't think about it much. Every pupil is encouraged to understand the worth of America over governments based on prejudice. I'm so glad I'm an American, because that means I can walk along the streets and no one can persecute me, as they did my aunt in Germany. The Nazis killed her just because she was Jewish. But every pupil also learns that his country is not perfect, that clear thinking and intelligent action by his generation will be needed to maintain its slow progress toward perfection. All right, then. We're all agreed that equal justice is another thing that's essential in democracy. Now, what else? Mr. Moderator. Janet? How about equal opportunity? For instance, if we make the people of one racial group live in the worst houses and go to the worst schools and take the worst jobs, why, that's not democracy. Today, in such democratic experiments as the Springfield Plan, steadily spreading across the nation, men of goodwill find hope for a new and wider understanding of basic American principles, principles only recently restated by Congressman Jerry Voris of California. Mr. Speaker, I have here a letter which one of my constituents wrote to his son, now serving in the Army overseas, and I would like to read it. Dear Ken, several days ago, you wrote that you were not clear on what you were fighting for, except perhaps to get the war over with and come home again. You are fighting to determine whether the men of the world shall exist merely for the sake of governments or whether the governments of the world shall exist for the sake of men. That definition of the conflict makes sense to me. I think it will make sense to you. Underneath is the basic concept of democracy, namely that all men are born equal, equal in the right to share in the fruits and opportunities of the earth. And by all men, we mean all men. We have made a lot of progress since 1776, even since 1918. And we are fighting for the right to keep on making progress. We, as a democratic people, hold that the highest values on earth 
are the rights of mankind. And it is because of this that we fight. Love from Dad.